It has been a little over three months since I uploaded my Kirby Iceberg video, or should I say my Kirby Iceberg feature length film, because it is bordering on being five hours long. And despite having such a terrifyingly long length and coming from some random dude who probably just popped up in your recommendations one day, it actually broke over 100,000 views. And I just want to say thank you to anybody that clicked on that video, even if you hated it with every fiber of your being, because you gave me your view and I appreciate that. And after releasing such a successful, yet uh, oddly unpolished video, I decided to go into hiding, and for three months I spent it all not polishing my craft, but I guess we could say that. And during my time hiding, the last thing I thought I'd do was make another Kirby Iceberg video. But uh, here we are, I'm making a Kirby Iceberg follow-up because I guess five hours just won't cut it. I just want to say this right now, I am not an Iceberg channel and I have no plans on becoming an Iceberg channel. The reason why I made the original Iceberg image was mainly because icebergs just kind of captivated me at the time, the concept was interesting, the stuff on some icebergs was interesting, so I decided to take a shot at it. And the reason I made the original Iceberg video was because I wanted to pursue video making for a while and I figured that would be the best way to get into it. Maybe I could gain an audience, icebergs were decently popular at the time, I guess we could say. I got over 100,000 views on that, that's gotta mean something. And it was also in order to explain everything on the iceberg, if I were to just randomly dump that on Twitter and expect someone to just cover the iceberg in a video, they would definitely be lost on a few entries, and with me being the person who created the iceberg, I obviously know what I'm talking about here, so I figured I should just give that a shot. The reason why I'm making this video right here is because I feel like there's a few errors I made in the previous video that I should probably address. There's some more information about certain topics that have come out, so I might as well just talk about that. And I either found out about or remembered some cool Kirby facts I could probably make a small little iceberg out of. I did not make a small little iceberg out of these facts, I instead decided to tack them onto my already existing Kirby iceberg monstrosity. I also got rid of a few of the dumb entries and corrected some errors I made with certain entry titles. We'll get to those in a second, hold on when we get to the corrections, don't get ahead of yourself. And don't worry, I know this image is really hard to read on video, that's why I uploaded it to my Twitter. Got my Twitter handle on screen, but if you're too lazy to just go onto twitter.com and type that in, don't worry, I got a link in the description. I think you should follow me, I post some pretty good stuff on there, nice high quality tweets with lots of effort and thought put into them. I'd also appreciate it if you decided to support this channel, you know what to do. And with all that out of the way, I say we revisit the Kirby Iceberg. Uh, but first, I think maybe there's a few things I should address before we get into that. I suppose there's no better place to start with iceberg corrections than talking about the one entry that was basically just a waste of time. I said that Chef Kawasaki was not in Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland, despite the fact he is clearly right there in the Quick Draw subgame. His entry has been removed from the iceberg because it's basically just a waste of an entry. He's right there, that is definitely Chef Kawasaki. If I had to defend myself here, I'd say that I might have just completely forgot Kawasaki was in here because I'm more familiar with the original Quick Draw from Kirby's Adventure. I probably completely forgot that Nightmare in Dreamland basically just copy and pasted Samurai Kirby and put it on a Game Boy Advance. Probably should have done a bit of research into that though. I also probably should have attempted to translate the Charbon picture and quote unquote Kirby Tree Pinball. With the Charbon picture, I claimed that there was a cloud like creature next to Charbon, even though that's actually Kirby covered in bubbles. Can't fault me too hard on that one, although I probably should have translated that. But for the second one, oh my god, Kirby 3D Pinball, where do I even begin with this? I took that off of an eBay listing. I knew that this game was not called a 3D Pinball. I had it, I could take as many nice, high quality shots as I want, and I could translate any one of those. But for some reason I didn't, so I guess uh, vent your anger to the guy on eBay is what I would say if he didn't just delete his listing. Maybe he was ashamed he called it 3D Pinball, I don't blame him. I suppose you also can't fault me too hard on claiming that Acro's tail or fin or whatever is behind the Kirby monstrosity used on the perfect and all minigame screen in Kirby 64. In all honesty, probably should have just consulted a video. I was not about to perfect the Kirby 64 boss rush just so I could watch this Mother 3 Chimera looking ass turn the hell around. I also made a small little goof talking about Arcana, the SNES game where Kirby made his real first appearance. 
I had the audacity to say that this game came out in 1999, when it actually came out in 1992, and then immediately after go and call this the first appearance of Kirby. Like, how did I not catch that? Now, these next three aren't really corrections, it's more of what I probably should have elaborated on a little more, although not, like, to the point where it becomes a deep dive. I had no idea why Capsule J was removed from Kirby Superstar Ultra, and it turns out the reason might be because it looks like the character Twinbee from the titular Konami Shoot 'em Up series. I've heard of Twinbee probably like two, three times at most, and I played it on Nintendo Switch Online, even though I don't remember doing that. I played it for like two minutes. Being someone so unfamiliar with the Twin Bee series, it makes this picture look actually quite scary. It looks like Capsule J with a mouth. I do not like it. Capsule J, you are not you when you're hungry. Have some Super Mario 3D's gummies. There we go, old buddy. Looking much better now. I'm sure if they really wanted to, Hal could just bring Capsule J back from the dead. What's Konami gonna do? The series has been dormant since 2013. Besides, Konami probably wouldn't sue. They're busy pouring all their money into their next Castlevania slot game. I also put in like the very bare minimum amount of effort when it comes to explaining what Baton and Top do. I don't know about you, but I think that the ability to control your opponent and to cut through surfaces are pretty important. And finally, I probably should have mentioned that Backdrop Kirby looks super similar to Fighter Kirby when talking about the Nightmare in Dreamland box art. I am in no way wrong saying that that is Fighter Kirby on the box art. That artwork has been established as Fighter Kirby artwork from the anime, and as you can see, he is kicking there. Why would Backdrop Kirby be kicking? It's called Backdrop, not Kick Kirby. Now, speaking of Kick Kirby, does anyone remember that game, or is that just me? Okay. You don't get Kirby copy abilities that are more similar than Fighter and Backdrop. They have practically the same design. For crying out loud, a Nightmare in Dreamland's Backdrop Kirby sprite is literally the exact same as the Fighter Kirby sprite used in the flagship titles. I completely understand why one would think that this is Backdrop Kirby, but no, this is definitely Fighter. And there's the correction, so be sure to keep these in mind the next time you go on my tubular Kirby Iceberg video. And if you have not seen my Kirby Iceberg video, I suggest you check it out now. You are watching the second part, I don't see why you wouldn't watch the first one even if it is 5 hours long. 100% of people came out of that Kirby Iceberg video learning something new. If you do not learn something new, I will give you your 5 hours back. I cannot give you 5 hours back. Therefore, you will learn a new piece of Kirby knowledge. That is a promise. And now we get into the real meat of the video, but before we start covering the all new entries, there's a few deeper dives we need to get out of the way first. Now you may be asking yourself, what is a deeper dive, Mr. Kirby Iceberg Pekachow Man? And to that I say, a deeper dive is further looking into a topic after I learned more information after the Iceberg video was posted. So basically these are elaborations on topics, okay, you got that? Alright, we cool, we cool? Alright, so in typical Kirby Iceberg fashion, <clears throat> Kirby GCN. Recently, a bit of E3 2005 footage has resurfaced, and it depicts some Kirby GCN gameplay. We get two different scenes here, the first one being Kirby and his helpers on a halberd stage, and the second having the warp star being locked away inside HRD3 before we get a nice clean shot of DDD piloting the robot. It may only be a few seconds, but I am really happy to see that we actually got some new Kirby GCN footage, and it gives me some hope we'll eventually find more in the future. King DDD drooling while eating. Not exactly the classiest topic to return to, but I did leave out a major point in the King DDD drooling while eating lore. I know who the artist is, and they exposed themselves on Twitter because someone asked a question. What's the biggest impact you made on the internet? I am the reason Nigel Thornberry became a meme, and I also made this gif. And the artist, whose name is Mao, Twitter handle at Pekachow1. Oh, Okay, sorry, 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 I couldn't help myself. I'm not telling you their Twitter handle, but you should probably check mine out, just, just saying. Okay, back on topic, the artist decided to say King DDD drooling while eating, along with supplying some pictures of the Sears listings and some of the items in question. And this caused the Twitter user, Volt the Raichu, to initiate a conversation. Alright, so I think this might give us a little more insight into the King DDD drooling while eating lore as well, so I might as well narrate this conversation. Ahem. Okay, okay, but why? But why not? He looked at that picture and asked me that question again. Seeing as I drew it and it was straight up a Could I do this? At that time, it really is a why not. And also why is on a plate and a clock. 
What happened here was that the seller used either a bot or manually searched for images to use and sell through Sears on stuff. Those who noticed it fast enough were able to actually order those things before it was taken down. And Sears was completely fine with that? Seemingly they were until the word got out and realized what they were printing and sending out. Someone in Sears looked at that and what it was they were selling and they thought, What the fuck is this? I row her. In the sound test of Kirby 64, there exist three different sound effects that are actually the poem Iroha, except really sped up and pitched up, so basically it's Nightcore Iroha. It's also theorized that these were supposed to play on the TVs found in Shiver Star Stage 3, but uh, we have no idea. Maybe, maybe not, who knows. And as a comment pointed out to me on the original video, the Kirby Star Allies original soundtrack website, which on a side note, I have no idea why the original soundtrack costs like $100. I think it's ridiculous. You could just listen to those songs on YouTube. <sighs> oh yeah, I forgot. Well, Nintendo back at it again. Well, I mean, you could always just pop in Kirby Star Allies and just, you know, listen to the music and the sound test. But I mean, the original soundtrack comes with these cool little picture piece pictures, you know, like in the game. You know what? I think that's pretty cool. I might just splurge and buy this right now. Ah, oh, damn it. My balance is in the negatives again. Okay, where were we? Oh yeah, the website. All right, so besides like the very top of the website basically pressuring you to buy the CD, the rest of the website is just this big long interview with the Kirby Star Allies staff. And understandably, someone brings up the topic of Void Termina's voice, I mean, listen to him. Oh my god, what a hunk, he is so dreamy! And it is here where we learn that the man behind the Void Termina voice is not actually a man at all, but four people that Shinya Kumazaki instructed to say, Iroha ni hoheto Kirby, and nailed it first try. While it's never directly stated that this is a reference to the sound in Kirby 64, it can definitely be inferred. You know, Kumazaki just loves cramming in all those nice references to the Kirby series. He just can't go a game without flooding it with references. I'm more than willing to give my main man the benefit of the doubt and say he did that on purpose. Kirby manga. <sighs> this one's gonna be a mouthful. You know, like, like mouthful mode? G get it? When I talked about Kirby manga previously, I only touched upon the big ones. I did not even get into some of the smaller and more obscure ones, which is exactly what we're going to be doing here. Well, we might as well kick it off with the earliest and most obscure Kirby manga, the Katobi Kirby of the Stars manga by Sayori Abe. This manga was serialized in a first grade magazine from 1992 to 1993, and when I say that this manga is obscure, I mean to the point where it's basically teetering on becoming lost media obscure. The only reason we even seem to know much about this manga is probably from the Japanese Kirby Wiki for being able to preserve the plot synopsis, the characters, and a few panels. And trust me, I know this manga seems like really fake. I thought this picture here was like fan-made until I found the Japanese Kirby Wiki. But you gotta trust me, all of this is real, and if you don't believe me, just go on the Japanese Kirby Wiki and check for yourself. Alright, well I suppose we should start getting into these details with a few of the exclusive characters. Those being Kirby's human friend in Nana that accompanies him on his adventures, the dinosaur Pochi that resides within Castle DDD, and the four DDD Emperors, although we only know of two of these Emperors being the Thorn Queen and Black Kirby. Like I said, the manga is just really bizarre, and the stories definitely help with that. My personal favorite story comes from the August 1993 issue where, get this, Black Kirby uses a western-style toilet bowl to trap Kirby so he can pretend to be the real Kirby and deceive Nana. I swear, I am not making this up. I think I should also mention that some enemies, such as Waddle Doo and Grumples of all enemies for some reason, actually appear in this manga, according to the Japanese Kirby Wiki, although no pictures have resurfaced. Up next we have Kirby of the Stars by Chibi Nyan, which was serialized in a third grade magazine from 1993 to 1994. Much like its predecessor, this manga is also extremely difficult to read, and it seems to take most of its characters from the actual Kirby games, with the one exception being this character who I believe is named Mano Shijiju. He is an elderly human character that has a thick mustache and pair of eyebrows, small glasses, and is decked out with a fancy hat and suit. Up next is yet another manga called Kirby of the Stars, this time being by Noemi Maeda, and it was serialized in a first grade magazine from 1994 to 1996. As far as I know, the manga only uses characters from the actual Kirby games, and is also very difficult to find. I know, the serialized Kirby manga being hard to find, whoa! Despite the manga being hard to find, Maeda has actually released three episodes from three different issues on her note, which is a Japanese social media site. She also drew artwork of Kirby and King Dedede in 2018, and you know what, you gotta respect the old Kirby manga artist coming back to redraw these characters, I, I like that. Next up we have Kirby Quiz by Hiroshi Takase. 
The manga was serialized in a kindergarten magazine from 1995 to 1998 and featured basic quizzes and puzzles with a Kirby theme. How basic were these quizzes and puzzles, you ask? Well, I have no idea, but considering this was in a kindergarten magazine, I'm going to assume they were probably, like, baby stuff. Sometimes, though, these quizzes would not actually have answers and would instead be used as prize applications, where I guess if you like, got a question right, you would be in the running to win a prize. Now, what kind of prizes we're dealing with here, I have no idea, but considering the fact this was serialized in a kindergarten magazine, I'm gonna have to guess maybe, uh, Kirby Building Blocks? Maybe? Moving on, we have Kirby Dreamland's Friends by Kagemaru Himeno. The manga was serialized in 5th and 6th grade magazines from 2002 to 2003 and basically had Kirby and other enemy characters living within Castle DDD, so basically a Kirby sitcom. Unfortunately, as glorious as that sounds, I think it might actually be another manga that's just lost to time because I can only find this one picture. And rounding out the super obscure serialized manga, we have Kirby of the Stars is a big hit by Takahiro Yamashita. It was serialized in a 4th grade magazine from 2003 to 2005 and featured characters such as Bubbles and Gip getting a bit more attention, as well as crossing over with various Kirby games that were relevant at the time. Magical Tower of Metal Land In the original Iceberg video, I did Magical Tower of Metal Land so dirty, I like barely even talked about it, I only bought up a few points I got from the Kirby wiki, nothing else, so... I'm here to make up for that by actually talking about the game and, you know, showing footage. So back to the actual entry, Kirby of the Stars Magical Tower of Metal Land was an arcade game made by Atlas in December of 2007. The game was a coin pusher game with some slot and roulette elements featuring a slot machine where you need to get three of the same picture in order to have a chance at spinning the roulette wheel, where whatever it stopped on would give you a predetermined amount of coins that would be added to your little coin area. The slots featured different characters from the anime, while the roulette wheel featured all sorts of different Kirby copy abilities, including a Star Rod jackpot that would cause a treasure chest of coins to just rain down. Near the top of the machine by said treasure chest is a Kirby statue where he is holding the warp star and can actually do a bit of light movement, such as moving his hands and feet. The outside of the machine features all sorts of different artwork from the anime and can seat up to eight different players. There also exist many videos of people playing these machines, such as the one you're seeing right now. This one's of Japanese origin, you probably won't find it yourself, so I got a link in the description in case you want to see the full thing. The machine has also been mentioned on Atlas's website according to an archived page, and is currently still available to view on HAL Laboratory's website. The current whereabouts of the machine are unknown, although a leaflet did go up on Yahoo Japan auctions once, if that really matters for anything. Not much else to say, so I guess I'll let the machine do the talking for me. Oh yeah, did I mention that around Halloween some arcades would actually give the Kirby statue a little hat and put some coins all over it? I just thought that was neat. Kirby of the Stars Poo 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 Adventure. Alright, so I want you to take a nice long look at this Donkey Kong game. You notice anything? Once you get past the initial shock of realizing this thing has the Donkey Kong Country cartoon brand attached to it because that show was just ungodly popular in Japan for some reason. Those of you with a keen eye may actually notice that this is the exact same game as Kirby of the Stars Poo 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 Adventure. This means that much like Egg Catcher, Poo 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 Adventure is a reskin of a different game, this time being made by Takara. Whatever the original version of this game is, I have no idea. I highly doubt it's the Donkey Kong one. I tried doing research, I couldn't find like any results, but the original Mr. Mouth was a Pac-Man game, so it's not entirely out of the question. Oh, well, Mr. Mouth, you say? Well, I guess we could call him... Mr. Mouthful Mode, am I right? Alright, there is still one more deeper dive that needs to be done here, but I am saving it for last because it might just be the most fascinating deeper dive here. So much information has been uncovered since my original Kirby Iceberg video about this topic, so I figured it would be best just to save it for last. So, uh, let's go on with the new entries now, shall we? Fatal Error. During the third phase of the fight with Stardream or Stardream Solo S in Kirby Planet Robobot, the comet will initiate a countdown, you know, as a Galactic Nova would. The countdown starts at 5 and goes all the way down to 0, and depending on what number you're on, Stardream will use a different type of attack corresponding to said number. These include sending out 5 different 5-shaped projectiles to attack you in a cross pattern, or having 2-2 two, two projectiles fused together and start- Speedy 360! 
After the number transition attack, Stardream will pit you against one of the many objects that can be found on the Galactic Nova from Kirby's Superstar, and what you're supposed to do is defeat the object and use the capture inhale to take in any debris and then fire a planet buster to deal damage to Stardream. However, if you don't defeat Stardream in time, the countdown will eventually hit zero, causing Stardream to send out a message that reads, Go. Stardream will then spam you with a bunch of fatal error messages, and with good movement and a nice usage of the sail winger, the barrel roll if you really want to call it that, you can actually survive the onslaught and cause the counter to reset. What exactly fatal error means is unknown, but considering that the Galactic Nova from Kirby Superstar had a countdown for a wish, it would only make sense that the same applies here, which leads to a rather morbid theory that the fatal error message actually applies to Haltman's wish to see his daughter Susie again. Haltman's main motivation for building Star Dream was to see his daughter Susie again, who unknowingly to him was right there as his secretary the whole time. The reason why the countdown suffers from a fatal error at the end is because the wish is just kind of pointless considering Susie is right there. Although Haltman did have no idea and, uh, well, he never learned that. He just kind of died not knowing where his daughter was, but uh, what are you going to do? That's Kirby lore for you. Kirby's Adventure Canon Icon Deep within the files of Kirby's Adventure lies a little spot where all the ability icons stay. It's called the Icon Jacuzzi, and whenever... Any ability icon needs to, you know, come out and serve its intended purpose in the game. It comes out of the jacuzzi, but rumor has it that there is one icon that actually drowned in the jacuzzi. This icon is called the cannon icon, and as you probably could have guessed, it features Kirby inside of a cannon with a lit wick just slowly getting over to that cannon, ready to just send that boy into orbit. The most interesting thing about this icon is that it's actually not entirely unused. It actually does show up in the mix roulette for a split second. And oddly enough, despite the fact that most versions don't feature this icon being used whenever Kirby sets foot into a cannon, the European and French versions actually do, as well as the game's 3D classics re-release on the 3DS. Roughneck Kirby Roughnecks, also known as cue balls prior to Generation 4, are a trainer class from the Pokemon series, and they're usually depicted as big bald men wearing leather jackets. One roughneck by the name of Kirby can be found in Route 209's Lost Tower in Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Brilliant Diamond, and Shining Pearl, where he fights you using only a Cleffa. Going off the guy's name, appearance, and Pokemon of choice, it's pretty clear that this guy was a reference to the main man himself. Not to mention that his team kinda... Sucks. Donkey Konga. Donkey Konga was the first installment in a trilogy of rhythm games for the Donkey Kong series that were developed by Namco and released for the Nintendo GameCube, making use of the console's DK Bongo's peripheral to play music. One interesting thing to note about Donkey Konga is that the American, Japanese, and European releases all feature almost entirely different sets of songs. Another interesting thing about Donkey Konga is that most of the game's tracks are comprised of either licensed songs, which, uh, can definitely be quite interesting. And just a reminder, this is canon, I guess. Or songs related to Nintendo properties, and Kirby just so happens to be one of those properties featured. There are two Kirby songs, one featured in the Japanese version and the other featured in the American version, both being intros to the anime, with Japan having Kirby, the anime's second opening, While in America, we of course get Kirby right back at ya. I have no idea how that got there. Wrong clip. Unfortunately, they used the version where they cut the How Can I Help You, King DDD, for the instrumental, which is kind of lame, but I guess it will suffice. Still better than what Europe got. Taiko no Tatsujin. Looks like Donkey Konga isn't the only drum-based Namco-developed rhythm game to feature a reference to Kirby. That's basically a rundown of Taiko no Tatsujin, besides the fact it's just immensely popular in Japan. I swear, Taiko has had some interaction with basically every single big franchise in Japan. It is ridiculous. Wait, is that Sonic 4? Like, like Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1? No. No. I mean, when you can collaborate with McDonald's not once, but twice, you must be the next big children's movie coming out, or you're just one step closer to world nomination.
While we're on the topic of things Tycho has collaborated with twice, how about those Kirby collaborations? The first collaboration was in the game Taiko no Tatsujin, a Dokodan Mystery Adventure, where Kirby and King DDD can be unlocked as battle members. The second was in Taiko no Tatsujin Yellow Version, where you can unlock Kirby and Meta Knight costumes by clearing the songs Kirby's Dreamland Medway and Boarding the Halberd, respectively. Amy Birnbaum Amy Birnbaum was a voice actress that once worked on the properties of 4Kids Entertainment before they, uh, you know, went down. Some of Burnbaum's roles include Max from Pokemon, Charmy from Sonic X, or Spikehead. Fuck Spikehead. However, you might not have known that Burnbaum actually played Kirby for a few seconds in the anime's first episode. While dubbing Kirby right back at you for Western audiences, four kids saw no reason to dub over Makiko Omoto's lines as Kirby because he's usually just speaking in his own language, and well, I guess his occasional bouts of saying, like, Japanese words somehow slipped by the four kids Japanese culture detector somehow. But the Japanese culture detector did manage to catch one moment from the first episode where Kirby is saying the names of Tiff, Tuff, Lolo, and La La La, or Fololo and Falalas, they're called in the dub for some reason. Obviously, all the characters have different names in the original Japanese version, so four kids had Burn Bomb dub over Kirby's lines. Here's a clip of the redubbed lines, just to notice how Kirby sounds different at the start of the clip than he does at the end. In case you were wondering, my name's Kirby right back at you, physical releases. The anime has had a staggeringly large amount of home media releases from all around the world, and while most people know the American and Japanese DVD and VHS tapes, there is a lot more than that, and uh, some of them are actually pretty strange. Starting with the anime's country of origin, Japan had 34 different VHS tapes released that spanned the anime's full 100 episode lifespan, each VHS containing 2 to 3 episodes on it. They were also split into three different series, with the first series covering the first seven volumes, the second series covering the next seven volumes, and the third series just containing everything else. The first 12 volumes also had DVD releases, and there was also a special one-off DVD called The Perfect Circle Collection, which contained episodes 13 and 49. Up next we have the anime's American releases, with our first stop being a collection of three DVDs, which also had VHS tape releases, that covered the first nine episodes of the series. Each volume contained three episodes and was named after one of the episodes featured within. Additionally, there was also a cancelled Volume 4 titled Escargoon Squad that would have covered the next three episodes, but interestingly enough, it was actually cancelled. There was also a box set called The Kirby Collection that bundled all three volumes together. There was also two DVDs that were a part of 4Kids' DV double shot line called Ice Kirby and Cook Kirby, both featuring two episodes that had respective abilities. There was also a Fright to the Finish DVD that had episodes 96 to 100 all condensed into a feature-length movie with episode 26 as a bonus feature, as well as the first 14 episodes being distributed evenly between two DVDs titled Kirby's Adventures in Cappy Town and Kirby, Cappy New Year and Other Adventures. Some of the more obscure ones from around the world include the Brazilian DVDs, which include the first four episodes of the otherwise almost entirely lost Brazilian dub, two Chinese DVDs that contain the first 26 episodes, and my personal favorite, the three Serbian DVDs that contain the first 15 episodes and look absolutely hideous. The amount of random Kirby art just slapped onto these DVD covers is ridiculous. I don't even know what to say about these. These are just so strange. And I guess if you really want to count these, a Famitsu bonus DVD from 2003 contained the Kirby of the Stars pilot, and Kirby's Dream Collection contains episodes 1, 60, and 72. Kirby 64 Test Stages Making use of certain codes and inputting them into a game shark, you can actually access a few different stages in Kirby 64 that were designed to test certain elements of the game. These include Abe 200, a room where you're just trapped in this green box area and Adeline is just there to paint you a Maxim Tomato, Abe 100, a giant flat stretch of land containing various different types of terrain, and a Test 1, a room where Kirby simply just falls endlessly down a gray void, and a Test 2, a wide open area with this overly bright checkerboard grid in the background. 
item 01, a very long room that contains many different types of food and stars, along with some blocks and water that lack any sort of collision. Break test 01, a fairly basic room with this really nasty looking broken white wave texture that's just repeated in the foreground. And exercise 0, which allows me to live my childhood dream of playing the Kirby 64 demo stage. I don't know why I wanted to play that so bad, I just really did. Maybe it was something about the checkerboard that's not exactly the pinnacle of level design. Starlight Children's Foundation The Starlight Children's Foundation is an organization dedicated to helping ill children, and in October of 2011, they actually had a collaboration with Nintendo to promote Kirby's return to Dreamland. Thankfully, the website for the collaboration is still up, and the page reads, Hey Kirby fans, to celebrate how Kirby, trademark, uses his super abilities to overcome obstacles and defeat his enemies in the Kirby's Return to Dreamland game, Nintendo is teaming up with the Starlight Children's Foundation. The Nintendo sponsorship of Starlight Fund Centers to select hospitals across the country demonstrates the power of helping others. You can print a free coloring sheet, have your children do their best artwork, and then send it into Nintendo. They are updating a slideshow regularly on their site. Maybe your child's artwork will appear. So basically think those magazines where you'd send in the pictures to the magazine so it could get featured in the gallery section, but it would get lost in the mail and you wouldn't be chosen. But with Kirby coloring pages and the magazine is Nintendo's website. It's kind of a bummer I couldn't find too many finished Kirbys. My favorite hobby besides, of course, stealing lunch money is taking the piss out of children's drawings. But uh, I take what I can get. These are some pretty good Kirbys. Stoppy. Stoppy is not just an unused enemy in Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. Stoppy is an enigma. We have absolutely no idea what Stoppy looks like, because when you try to spawn Stoppy into your game using the appropriate code, you get... Oh, buddy, you're not doing too hot. Someone better get this gun of an ambulance. Sometimes Stoppy will jump. That, that's pretty much it. That's really all he does. He's no Takon, but he's still a very fascinating organism nonetheless. Super Famicom Box System The Super Famicom Box System was a pay-per-play version of the Super Famicom that was used inside of Japanese hotels, and despite the special console having no Kirby games on it, the console's intro has Kirby spinning a coin accompanied by Kirby's Dream Course music. It is speculated that HAL Laboratory actually had a hand in developing the box system and decided to include Kirby in the intro as a signature of their work. But what do I know? That's just a theory. A game theory. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Movie SNES Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Movie is an SNES game based on the Super Charisma movie, and it contains various images hidden in the files. These filler images range from faces on solid-colored backgrounds to the words Bandai, referencing the game's publisher. However, the most notable out of all of these images is a 32x32 32 32 portrait of Kirby sleeping. Hal had absolutely nothing to do with this game, so it's unknown why Kirby is just here as a filler image, although it is speculated that it was probably just used as a placeholder. Kirby's History Regional Differences The Japanese and American versions of Kirby's Dream Collection both feature a multitude of differences that can be found in the Kirby's History section of the game. Some of these differences include having some of the years for specific games be altered depending on when they were released in their respective region, Kirby's Superstar Stacker and Magical Tower of Metal Land being included in the Japanese version while Kirby's Avalanche was exclusively included in the American version, and to the Japanese version including various Kirby manga released up to that point, as well as allowing you to read a few pages. Kirby and the Amazing Mirror Who Are You commercial The North American commercials for Kirby and the Amazing Mirror were actually lost until YouTuber George Sanchez decided to upload them to YouTube on October 18th, 2020, coincidentally the same day that the game released 16 years ago in North America. It's pretty much the exact same commercial as the Japanese commercial, you know, Kirby in the cage and he has to call his buddies to bust him out, except they decided to put a James Bond aesthetic over it, which actually looks kinda cool. There's also two different variations of the commercial, one being about 30 seconds long, while the other condenses it into about half the time. Sanchez would later go on to upload both of them to the Internet Archive, where he would also reveal that he found them on VHS recordings of Kids WB. ST underscore Halberd. The song Fly, Kirby of the Stars, from Kirby's Return to Dreamland that plays in another dimension is oddly enough called ST underscore Halberd in the game's files. And using that new Kirby GCN footage we talked about a while ago, the Twitter user Kirby Music Facts came up with a theory that this music was originally going to play on the Halberd stage we can see in that trailer. Knowing about all that Kirby GCN repurposed into Return to Dreamland stuff, it doesn't exactly seem far-fetched that this might be the case, especially considering Return to Dreamland borrowed the song from the first Kirby GCN trailer. Kirby Squeak Squad DS Lite 
Back in 2007, the Australian magazine K-Zone held a competition where 40 winners within this competition would be able to win a Kirby Squeak Squad DS Lite. Apparently, in order to enter the competition, you need to tell K-Zone in under 25 words why Kirby Squeak Squad is cool, which is uh, kind of stupid, but uh, I guess it works. The console itself is entirely white, with the exception being some artwork of Kirby holding a treasure chest found on the very top. And considering that only 40 were ever produced, it was a part of a really dumb competition, and it was only released in Australia. It's no wonder why this is commonly regarded as one of the rarest DS consoles of all time. Air Ride and Style Ability Contest There was a contest held in Japan for the 97th episode of the anime Air Ride and Style Part 2, where viewers would be able to submit their own custom Kirby copy abilities and four lucky winners would be chosen and featured in the episode. At this point, we all know the winners of the contest were Baton, Top, Iron, and Water, but how about the abilities that weren't so lucky? I'm not gonna sit here and name off all the abilities that were submitted, we'd be here all day if I was doing that, but some of the ones that I found while going through the list that really grabbed me were Thief Kirby, Whatever Kirby, Moist Kirby, Toy Train Kirby, Bean Kirby, Cyborg Kirby, Milk Kirby, Electric Fan Kirby, and Rapper Kirby. While I'm not exactly sure if most abilities even had any drawings accompanying them or if they were just submitted as ideas, I know that there were three runner-ups that did actually have pictures supplied, being Cowboy Kirby, Turtle Kirby, and Traffic Signal Kirby. Toyota Corolla Kirby Events Back in 2003, Toyota Corolla, I repeat, Toyota Corolla, held a three Kirby illustration events and one Kirby coloring event exclusively in Japan. Each event had a total of three different possible prizes you could win, and how these events would work is that you'd bring your Kirby drawing to the nearest Toyota Corolla store, hand it in, get your participation prize, come back one to two weeks later, receive your return prize as well as your drawing, and if your drawing got an excellence award, you could actually get another prize. The first illustration contest ran from January 11th to January 13th, and the three prizes in order of value were a seal set, an overlay and pencil set, and a bead cushion. The next illustration contest ran from April 12th to April 13th, and the prizes were a book, a sketchbook, and a cushioned pail can. The third and final illustration contest was held from August 30th to August 31st, and the prizes were a name tag patch, a wall rack, and a carry cart. The one coloring contest that was held ran from July 12th to July 13th, and the prizes were an Uchiwa fan, a photo frame, and a picnic set. As for the current value and rarity of these items, you'd be hard-pressed to find them on an American shopping site, but in Japan, some of them are actually fairly common, such as the name tag, while others such as the picnic set and especially the carry cart are a little rarer and worth a lot more money. Hoshinokabi Kira Kira Metal Land Hoshinokabi Kira Kira Metal Land was an arcade game released in 2006, and much like Magical Tower of Metal Land, it was also manufactured by Atlas and falls into the same coin pusher genre. The game has 10 different stories, each being based on an episode of the anime, and I believe these were just randomly selected by a roulette, and all these stories would play out by having screenshots of the episodes with text boxes explaining what's going on, and sometimes the player would be interrupted and would have to spin a roulette or play a minigame. The game has over 15 different types of minigames, including a quiz, drawing, and monster battle game, and the only real footage of the game seems to come from a three-part series on the website Nico Video, where someone plays through the story based on a dental dilemma. High C Promotion I'm sure we all know what the High C Juice brand is, or at least I really hope we all do, but did you know that High C actually had a collaboration with Kirby? This comes in the form of a super obscure promotion for Kirby 64 that was held back in 2000, where like basically the only information I could find on it was that the Kirby 64 Ote Dama plushes were mail-away prizes. And while it's not strictly a Kirby promotion, High C collaborated with Nintendo to promote the Game Boy Advance, and Kirby appeared on the box for the smashing wildberry flavor of High C. Kirby Rap, Kirby Gets Played at Number 9. Kirby Rap, Kirby Gets Played at Number 9 is the name of a 2013 YouTube video uploaded by Hemron. While Hemron privated most of his videos at some point in time, most of them were actually preserved and can still be viewed on YouTube today by re-uploaders. And for the longest time, Kirby Rap was not one of those videos. I used to love watching Kirby Rap at a young age, it was probably one of my favorite YouTube videos, and I was really sad when I just couldn't find it anywhere on YouTube. After a while, I basically had it and decided to seek the video out myself in order to find this lost video and re-upload it back to YouTube where it belongs. I searched long and hard for months, but I just could not find anything. 
that was until I somehow stumbled across Hemron's Mario Gangster rap video. Much like Kirby rap, I remember watching the Mario Gangster rap when I was younger, and while at that time I had absolutely no idea that Hemron made both of those videos, something about the Mario Gangster rap just gave off this Kirby rap vibe to me. So I decided to do a little digging, find out the original uploader's name, and then I just searched up Hemron into YouTube and I saw this. Just from looking at the title of the song, I immediately knew what this was. Face plant, you know, like Kirby rap, the chorus, it literally just like repeats face plant at nauseum. Of course this was the Kirby rap music. But then again, finding only the music is half the battle. It's not the same without the video, so I kept searching for the video until I eventually stumbled upon Hemron's Reddit account. On his Reddit account, he would basically just post about, like, personal stuff and his rap parodies to different subreddits, and he made two posts to r slash Kirby, one being a behind-the-scenes photo of a woman getting into the Kirby costume from the video, and the other being a link to the video, which was unfortunately privated. Fortunately, though, I was able to snag the link and put it into the Wayback Machine, and after a little bit of, uh, just trying to work the Wayback Machine properly, I actually found Kirby rap, and I just completely lost it that night. After downloading the video, I very quickly uploaded it to YouTube, and now Kirby Rap is open for the public to view once again. Man, that was a nice trip back to the Kirby Iceberg. I hope we all learned something new today here, and hey, check that out. Look, we're not even an hour long yet. Much quicker trip, too, I gotta say. But, but I feel like I'm forgetting about something. Oh yeah, I still haven't talked about the deepest dive. So let's plunge under the Kirby Iceberg once again. We're gonna plunge where the sun don't shine. And finally, Kirby's Adventure Bath Toys. Remember in the original Kirby Iceberg when I talked about the Kirby's Adventure internal figures? Well, uh, it turns out they aren't internal after all. They were released in blind bags by Tomy, 250 and a pop. And I was indeed correct in saying that this print ad right here featuring these water squirters are actually prototypes to the water squirters that can be found in the Kirby Merchandise Museum. But for as good and cool as that information is, you want to know the coolest thing about my recent findings on these figures? I was able to find pictures of almost every single one with a little help from Luigi the Crab, by the way, Luigi is my brother. and Nightram, the owner of the Video Game Memorabilia Museum. For starters, I was able to nab both Kirby and Togizo, which is really crazy to me, especially considering that Togizo is probably the one that caught my attention in the set the most. You know, I did show them off on Twitter, so, you know, at Pekachow1, maybe, if you want to follow me. Mm-hmm, yeah, see my funnies? Okay, fine, I'll stop with the Twitter plugs for a bit. I gave Luigi the Crab permission to take pictures of these guys, you know, to spread some good old Togizo awareness on his Facebook account, and from here Nightram decided to come forward and say he actually recognized Togizo from a Yahoo Japan auction and would try to do some digging to rediscover the picture. A few days after that, Nightram would come forward supplying us with not only a picture of Togizo, but a picture of Bomber as well. Luigi the Crab would also discover a Yahoo Japan auction that had a naughty, giving us a high quality photo of him, and I would also find an angry Kirby that went up for sale on Mercari JP. While both of these listings had their bags, the angry Kirby actually came with a sticker, and while I'm not sure if the sticker actually came with the bath toys or not, it's still pretty cool nonetheless. I envy whoever got to snag that. And with the exception of Waddle Doo, there are at least decent photos from the Kirby Merchandise Museum for everyone else. However, despite having so much information come out about these figures, there are still two more mysteries left up in the air. Number one is just everything surrounding the prototypes. Are they destroyed? Are they in HAL Laboratory's possession? Are they made of plastic? Because it looks like they're made of plastic compared to the rubber the actual figures are made out of. And are there prototypes of the Angry Kirby, Blue Kirby, and Waddle Dee? Because those are the only ones that are missing from this picture. And number two is basically everything surrounding the enigma that is the Waddle Doo figure. I wasn't even able to find a low quality photo of the final Waddle Doo figure. The only reason I even know he's in the set is because he's on the print ad. Maybe a picture of one of them will show up one day and maybe these mysteries will be solved, but as far as I know, only time will tell. And there we have it. The Kirby Iceberg has officially been conquered. It has been a wild, but actually pretty fun ride doing this, and hopefully you learned lots of new Kirby knowledge, and can now be a walking Kirby encyclopedia like yours truly. 
But in all seriousness, thank you all so much for all the support on this channel and the first Iceberg video. I have no idea how the Kirby Iceberg did so well. It seemed like icebergs were just kind of dying out, you know? The Iceberg fad was coming to an end, but no, it turns out that that was actually really successful, and it's like the second most viewed Kirby Iceberg video on YouTube that's currently up. Like, the one with the most views currently is this Spanish Kirby Iceberg, and I don't know when and I don't know how, but someday I will take the throne. Trust me, mark my words, Mr. Spanish Kirby Iceberg Man, you are going down. Oh, would you look at the time? I need to retreat back into the bunker to avoid Kirby and the Forgotten Land spoilers. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Peck a chow out.